Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 23rd, 2014, and I want to mention that as we have done in the past, we'd like to know your top episodes of the year. To participate, go to econtalk.org, where you will find a link in the upper left-hand corner to a survey that will give you a chance to tell us a little bit about yourself, give us some general feedback if you'd like, as well as voting for your five favorite episodes of 2014. That survey will stay up through early February of 2015, and I will announce the results sometime in mid to late February. Now on to today's guest, Joshua Green, professor of psychology at Harvard University and the director of the Moral Cognition Lab there. He is the author of Moral Tribes, Emotion, Reason, and the Gap Between Us and Them, which is our topic for today's episode. Josh, welcome to Econ Talk. Oh, thanks very much for having me. So this is a fascinating, thought-provoking, and very ambitious book. Uh, it's really uh, – it's got an enormous amount of, of stuff packed into it, ideas, uh, claims for making the world a better place, some fantastic thought experiments. We'll try to do justice to the book. I want to start with what you call our tribal nature. You argue that we've evolved to be fairly effective cooperators within our tribes – but not so good cooperators with other tribes. Explain what you mean by that, what you mean by the tribes and the tragedy of common sense morality. Right. Well, so it begins with a question of well, what, what is morality to begin with? And what I think and, and a lot of other recent uh, commentators and some people in some sense going all the way back to Darwin think morality is fundamentally about is our social nature and more specifically about cooperation. That is that what we call morality is really a suite of psychological tendencies and capacities that allow us to live successfully in groups that allow us to reap the advantages of, of cooperation. Um, but these, but these, uh, tendencies that make up morality come uh, primarily in the form of emotional responses that drive social behavior and that, uh, and, and, and that respond to other people's social behavior. Um, I think the, uh, a natural starting point begins with a familiar story to economists. This is the, the tragedy of the commons, which I can talk about a little bit if you want. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah. So the, 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 the tragedy of the commons uh, is, is, is a parable told by the ecologist Garrett Hardin. Uh, he tells the story of a bunch of herders who share a common pasture, and these are uh, rational, self-interested herders uh, who ask themselves, should I add more animals to my, to my herd? And they think, well, uh, if I add more animals, that's more animals that I have at market, and that's good. What, that's the upside. What's the downside? Not so much downside. We're all sharing this common pasture. And so they say the costs outweigh the benefit, or the benefits outweigh the costs, and they add more and more animals to their herds. But then when they all do this, uh, there's not enough grass to support uh, any of the animals, and they all die, and everybody's worse off. And that's the famous tragedy of the commons. And it's basically a, a, a parable about the, co-op, the problem of cooperation, which is really the problem of how do you get people to put collective interest over self-interest. Um, and with, this with, is, the key, the, with the key point that by doing so, they'll be better off. Their self-interest will right. actually be served. So it's not, it's not a it's not a literal sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of, in the short run, for a longer run benefit. Uh, so if the it, it, that's right, if it's a repeated game, then it can be in every it's everybody's long term self interest. Uh, that that that's that I think that that's right. So if in in the short term it's a conflict between self interest and collective interest, but in the long term, uh, a cooperative system is one that makes everybody better off. Although at any given moment, it may be possible for someone, at least in a short sighted way, to benefit themselves at the expense of the group. Absolutely. Right. Um, and so the idea is that our, our minds are designed uh, to help us solve this problem. And uh, you, you can think of us as, as having psychological carrots and sticks that we apply to ourselves and that we apply to other people. So 
uh, a psychological carrot that we apply to ourselves to be cooperative would be feelings of love and friendship and goodwill that motivate us to say, hey, it's not my, just my sheep that matter. It's everybody else's sheep and you, and, and, or at least some other people's sheep um, and uh, motivates you to be cooperative. Or you can have negative feelings that act as a stick for yourself like shame and guilt. I would feel ashamed of myself if everybody else limited the size of their herds for the greater good and then I, 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 I cheated. And we have positive feelings that reward other people. So you have my gratitude if you keep your sheep in line. Uh, and we have negative feelings that punish other people. You'll have my contempt and my anger and my disgust if you grow your herd as much as you feel like uh, without regard for the rest of us who share the pasture. And so the idea is these feelings, these psychological carrots and sticks that we apply to ourselves and, and, and other people, that's the core of morality and that's what makes basic cooperation within a group possible. And just, just to mention Adam Smith uh, in the theory of moral sentiments, he says man desires not only to be loved but to be lovely. And so there's right. some self-regulating impulse to do the right thing because you want people to respect you. And those carrots and sticks are flying around with all of our social interactions. So it works right. pretty well. And we had uh, Pete Betke on Econ Talk talking about the work of Eleanor Ostrom, which she got the Nobel Prize for, where she explains that within small groups, they often devise – norms and, and other voluntary, uh, non-coercive ways to limit the tragedy. Uh, right. But w the, the problem you're fascinated by, which I am too, is uh, when two tribes come along and they don't share the same morality. So talk about the tragedy of common sense morality as you describe right. it. So this is, this is my sequel to, to Hardin's parable, and uh, one version of it goes like this. So imagine that there's this large forest. And all around this large forest are many different tribes. And these different tribes are uh, all cooperative, but they're cooperative on different terms. So on the one side, you might have your communist herders who say, not only are we going to have, uh, are, 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 not only are we going to have a common pasture, we're just going to have a common herd. And that's how uh, everything gets aligned. It's everything's about us. And on the other side of the forest, you might have the individualist herders who say, not only are we not going to have common herds, we're not going to have a common pasture. We're going to privatize the pasture and divide it up. And everybody's responsible for their own piece of land. And our cooperation will consist in everybody's respecting each other's property rights, as opposed to, uh, to, to, to sharing a common pasture. And you can imagine any number of arrangements in between. And there are other dimensions along which uh, tribes can vary. So they vary in, in what I call their proper nouns. So that is which leaders or religious texts or traditions have authority to govern daily life uh, in, in the tribe. And tribes may respond differently to threats and outsiders. Some may be relatively laissez-faire about people who break the rules. Other people may be incredibly harsh. Some people may be very, some tribes may be very hostile to outsiders. Others may be more welcoming. All different ways that tribes can uh, achieve cooperation on different terms. They're all dotted around this large forest. And then uh, the parable continues, uh, one hot, dry summer, uh, a lightning strikes and there's a forest fire and the forest burns to the ground and then the rains come and suddenly there's this lovely green pasture in the middle uh, and all of the tribes look at that pasture and say, hmm, nice pasture uh, and they all move in uh, and so now we have in this common space all of these different tribes that are cooperative in different ways, cooperative on different terms with different leaders, with different ideals, with different histories, all trying to exist in the same space and this is the modern tragedy. This is the modern moral problem. Uh, that is, it's not a problem of turning a bunch of me's into an us. That's the basic problem of the tragedy of the commons. It's about having a bunch of different us's all existing in the same place, all moral in their own way, but with different conceptions of what it means to be moral. And so if our basic psychology does a pretty good job of, of solving the me versus us problem of, of having basic cooperation within a group, the modern problem uh, both I think philosophically and, and, and psychologically, is what, what, what kind of a system and what kind of thinking do we need to regulate life on those new pastures of the modern world where we have many different tribes with many different uh, terms of cooperation, many different moral systems? Before we go, far, uh, before we go further, I want to just ask you an aside question that, uh, that I thought about as I was reading the book, which is you argue that we evolved morality – to help us solve these kind of problems, why do we why do we have different ones? And in particular, uh, you know, we'll probably come back to this later on. But I'm more of a bottom up guy than you are. You're you're, right. you're a top down guy more, more than I am. You you concede in places that 
top, the bottom up is good. And I, of course, concede in certain places the top down is, is good. But in over, overall, those are our, we have a philosophical difference. And you identify that difference to some extent with the, the northern and southern tribes, the northern right. tribes being more individualistic. Metaphorically northern and southern, yeah. Right, and southern mm-hmm. tribes being more collectivist. And, and as you point out, there's obviously right. lots of uh, gray areas in between. Why, why do you think right. there are such um, different ideologies to start with? Why do I? Why am I a bottom up guy, and why are you a top down guy? And and you um, talk a lot about the fact that, of course, we both think we're right, and we both think we have evidence for why we're right. But given that that the world's a complicated place, how do we get that difference to start with? Why don't we both have the same morality uh, to toward how we solve problems? Well, so I, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by bottom up and top down, but I, I actually have. I, I think the leading scientific explanations are at least what I would call pretty bottom up ish um, so uh, a, a couple of of, of, of uh, sort of places here so uh, Joe Henrik and, and and colleagues for example have collected uh, evidence from small scale societies all around the world and found quite a bit of variation in terms of how people cooperate uh, in the quote lab that is having them play uh, standardized economic games and then also in their in the, in in their in their everyday life so take the lamalera of indonesia um, these are people who uh, make their living by hunting whales in collective hunting parties so their their uh, their livelihood depends very much on cooperation and sure enough when you have them do public goods game, prisoner's dilemma, so the kinds of economic games that model the tragedy of the commons, they're exceptionally cooperative. Uh, You have other societies where people hunt uh, individually. I think, I hope I'm getting this right, but the Machi Genga uh, of, 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 I believe, Peru, but certainly in South America, they uh, hunt as, as individuals and individual families, and when they play these economic games, they are much uh, less cooperative, which is not to say that they're not cooperative people, but they they tend to cooperate within family as opposed to across families, at least ec- economically. Um, now, if you live in a place where there are there where, where where there are whales to be hunted, then there are advantages to having a cooperative way of life. If you live in the in 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 the Amazon where there aren't whales to be hunted, and the way you get food is by just going off in your own direction and finding what you can, then that lends itself to a more individualistic society. Um, there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago a couple of years ago. Or actually, maybe it was just this year uh, by uh, uh, Kitayama and colleagues uh, arguing that there are big differences between cultures that, and this is going back to some ideas from Richard Nisbet and colleagues, uh, cultures that cultivate wheat versus cultivating rice, that of the more collectivist cultures of Asia are ultimately driven by the original rice-based economy that lived there, where rice uh, uh, cultivation is in, is uh, – can be incredibly productive, but requires a lot of intense cooperation. And uh, Nisbet has also, for example, cited evidence about more individualistic tendencies for people who live in herding uh, cultures, where you know if it's a mountainous region and you're not going to be growing crops on the ground, but instead are going to be herding uh, sheep. Let's say that ends up leading towards a more individualist society. So, uh, not sure if we actually disagree on this. But no, I don't I, think I we think do that, at all. I'm yeah. just trying to I'm trying to to get a uh, a more nuanced view, which I think is in the book, which is uh, the tribe we're in is is not just uh, a result of evolution. It's also cultural and depends on our oh, situation. Absolutely. absolutely. Yes. No, I think that what we're born with is, uh, is, is a set of options that it's a lot like language, right? That all humans are born or all healthy humans are born with the capacity for language. But whether you end up speaking English or Chinese or something else is going to depend on uh, you know the environment, the linguistic environment into which you're born. So let's talk about the two trolley problems um, and what you learn about morality from those. Obviously, there's a lot of variations on the trolley problems that you talk about in the right. book. But talk about the two basic ones and yeah. and talk about what you mean by automatic mode and manual mode, which I found uh, very, very interesting. Right. OK. Well, so before I get to trolleys uh, specifically, let me say a little bit about how this, I think, connects to the first set of questions you asked about the tragedy of the commons and the tragedy of common sense morality. Because one of, one of the main ideas of the book is that uh, we have two kinds of problems. We also have two kinds of thinking. And that the kind and, and that our gut reactions, our intuitions, what I call automatic settings, which I'll explain in a moment, uh, 
do a good job of solving the original tragedy of the commons, but they create the problem of the, the, the tragedy of common sense morality, that we are, our gut reactions about how we ought to live make it harder for us to live in many ways in a, in a, in a pluralistic world. Um, so uh, let, let me give you, give you my, my metaphor, which would be familiar to people, for example, who've, who've read uh, – uh, well, at least the idea is familiar to people who've read Daniel Kahneman's uh, book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and a lot of the research on dual process decision-making. My, my preferred metaphor for this is the uh, is, uh, um, digital SLR camera. So the camera like you know, the one I got many years ago now uh, has the automatic settings on it. So if, uh, if just for everyday use, if you're taking a picture of a – mountain from a mile away in broad daylight, you put it in landscape mode and click point and shoot, you've got your shot. Or if you're taking a picture of somebody up close in indoor light, then you put it in portrait mode and click, you've got your shot. Um, and it also has a manual mode where you can by hand adjust the f-stop and every everything else. Uh, and you might say, well, why does, the, why does the camera have these two different ways of taking photos, your automatic settings and your manual mode? And the idea is that this allows you to navigate the trade-off between uh, flexibility and efficiency. So the automatic settings are very efficient, point and shoot, and they're good for the kinds of situations that the manufacturer has already anticipated, like taking a landscape picture or taking a standard portrait picture. But the manufacturer also knows that there are going to be situations that the manufacturer isn't going to specifically anticipate. And so the manufacturer also gives you a manual mode where you can adjust everything yourself. The manual mode is very flexible, but it's not very efficient. So you can do anything with it, but you have to know what you're doing. It takes time. You might make a mistake. Uh, and this this design of having both overall makes a lot of sense because sometimes, most of the time, you can get by just pointing and shooting, and that's what you really want. Uh, but occasionally, uh, you, you, you want to have the flexibility to put the camera in manual mode and get exactly what you want depending and if on you don't. On, on, and if, and if you don't, you're going to get a really bad picture sometimes. So right. it's, I think right. that's the exactly, – Exactly. The and real, so the yeah. idea is that the human brain has the same design, that we have automatic settings and we have our manual mode. So our automatic settings are our gut reactions, our largely emotional responses uh, to situations, especially social situations that tell us that's good, that's bad. This is what you ought to do. This is what you ought, uh, ought, ought not to do. Um, we also have a manual mode. We also have the ability to step back and think in a – explicit, deliberate, what you might call, you know, in a somewhat loaded sense, rational way uh, about whatever it is that's facing us. And we might override some gut reaction that we have because we'd say, well, in this case, uh, even though it feels like we should do this, it actually makes more sense to do that. Um, so with this idea in, in, uh, in mind of the tension between our automatic settings and our manual mode, our, our gut reaction and our, and our slow, deliberate thinking – I'll uh, in introduce, as you said, the the, the trolley dilemmas. Um, this is this is the the philosophical problem that kind of got me interested. Uh, well, really got me started as uh, my research as a scientist. Um, so, uh, one version of the trolley case goes like this: You've got a, a, a trolley headed towards five people, and you can uh, save them, but you, they're going to die if you don't do anything. But if you hit a switch, you can turn the trolley away from the five and onto another track, but where unfortunately there's still one person there. Um, and if you ask most people, is it okay to turn the trolley away from the five and have it run over the one person, depending on, on who you ask and how you ask it, about 90% of people will say yes. Um, better that one case. person dies than five. That's right. So it's just it's you know the trade off is between five lives and one, and and the particular mechanism is hitting a switch that will turn the trolley away from the five and onto the one. Um, parallel case, which we'll call the footbridge case. Uh, this time the trolley is again headed towards five people, but now you're on a footbridge over the track uh, in between uh, the oncoming trolley and 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 the five people, um, and. Uh, the, we stipulate the only way that you can save them now uh, is is to end up killing somebody. So there's this large guy wearing a large backpack who's right next to you. And uh, you can push him off of the footbridge and he'll land on the tracks. Uh, and uh, he'll die. He'll get killed by the trolley. But it will stop the trolley from running over the five people. Um, now, to, to cut down on the uh, number of angry emails that you get from people, I have to make some stipulations clear. We are stipulating that, A, you cannot jump yourself. Uh, the, the, the only way to save you're not, five you're people. You're not big enough. 
That's right. Yeah, it's right. They're not, not big enough. Uh, you cannot jump yourself. And yes, this will definitely work. Um, and I know you've all been to the movies and sometimes you're able to suspend disbelief. And I ask you to do the same thing here. And we ask our, our, our participants when we do these experiments to do the same thing. And in general, they don't have any, any problem doing this. Um, here, when the question is, is it okay to push the guy off the footbridge, use him as a trolley stopper to save the five people? Um, most people say no. Um, there are some populations uh, where, 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 where people are more likely to say yes. But in general, you know, if you take an American sample, somewhere between about 10 and 35 percent of people will say that it's OK to push the guy off the footbridge. But most people will say that it's not OK. Um, so interesting question. What what's going on? Why do we say that it's OK to trade one life for five when you can hit a switch that will divert the trolley away from five and on to one? But it's not okay to push the guy off the footbridge, even if we assume that this is going to work, and even if we assume that there's no other way to 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 achieve this worthy goal. Most people still say that it's wrong. So there's now been, uh, you know, we're coming up on a decade and a half of, of 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 research either on or stemming from 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 this moral dilemma, and we've learned a lot. Uh, it's uh, it seems that uh, it's primarily an uh, an emotional response to that physical action of pushing the guy off the footbridge. Uh, and you can see, for example, in a part of the brain called the amygdala, uh, which is you might think of as a mammal's early warning alarm system that something may be bad, needs attention, maybe not a good idea. Um, you see that alarm bell going off in this sort of basic part of the mammalian emotional brain. Um, and the strength of that signal is correlated with the extent to which people uh, say that it's wrong to push the guy off the footbridge or whatever it is. Um, you also uh, see increased activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's most closely associated with explicit reasoning or anything that really requires a kind of mental effort, like remembering a phone number or resisting an impulse of some kind or explicitly applying a, a behavioral rule. That's, that's sort of the seat of, 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 of manual mode. Um, and these two uh, signals from different parts of the brain one, a kind of automatic response to the action, and the other, thinking, uh, reflecting the, 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 the balance of costs and benefits, uh, do get out in the brain. And in some people, they go one way, and some people go the other way. Um, and you know, if you give people a distracting uh, secondary task, uh, then they are... Um, then it, then it slows down uh, their utilitarian judgments, that is the judgments where they say that it's okay to, 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 to kill one to save five. Uh, if you give people more time, they're more likely to give utilitarian judgment. People who uh, give more reflective answers to tricky math questions are more likely to say that it's okay to push the guy off the footbridge. Um, if you give people a uh, a drug that in the short term heightens certain kinds of emotional responses. So the drug used in these experiments were the citalopram, which is a, a SSRI kind of like uh, Prozac. Uh, people are more likely to say that it's wrong to push the guy off the footbridge. Uh, if you give people an anti-anxiety drug, uh, lorazepam is the one used in the study I have in mind, they're more likely to say that it's okay to push the guy off the footbridge. And so there's a lot of evidence from a lot of different kinds of experiments, brain imaging, behavioral manipulations, pharmacological manipulations, looking at patients with different kinds of brain damage that all support this kind of dual process story. That is that there's a gut reaction that's saying, no, don't push the guy off the footbridge. And then a more conscious, explicit calculating response that says, well, but you can save five lives. Don't you think that makes sense? Um, and well, I could go on, but I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, talk that. about why, um, how you might one might exploit uh, or use those differences in I mean, and I just have to say as a footnote I'm I it, there's a lot of experiments in economics that that show all kinds of different make all kinds of different claims about behavior and one of the aspects of these experiments of course and, and it's really a big one in the footbridge examples that this is a very alien experience mm -hmm. for most people and yeah. I think the challenge in interpreting it part of it is the fact that uh, if it happened every day if people were constantly shoving people over footbridges, maybe people right. would have different responses. Absolutely. Uh, there's a grappling uh, uncertainty issue. And even though you say don't be yeah. uncertain, it's uh, very – I think that's the automatic part maybe that's kicking in, not necessarily the morality. Yeah. But, it, but the point – let's put that to the side. It's definitely true that we have some gut reactions about some things and some more pensive and thoughtful reactions about others. What's the implication of that for uh, for these – uh, tragedies of common sense morality, these philosophical, ideological, moral differences between tribes and groups? So 
there are a few dots I think that sort of need to 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 to, to be connected. So if you sort of follow the arc of the book, uh, the first part is about the tragedy, the two tragedies, uh, and their different structure, and then the next part is about morality, fast and slow in 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 general. Um, and I think you know this initially is just illustrating the idea that our moral thinking involves a tension between gut reactions to certain types of actions that are generally bad, but maybe not always bad, and then a kind of, 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 of cost-benefit thinking that can either be selfish or it can be Im- Im- impartial in the case of the third-party observer saying, well, isn't it better to, 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 to save more lives? Um, what I propose as a solution to the tragedy of common sense morality is a much maligned and uh, poorly named philosophy, which many of your uh, listeners will be familiar with, known as utilitarianism. Uh, and, boo, you can hear that. <laughs> that was ooh, uh, ooh. It was just suspense. It wasn't necessarily I – I have an anti-utilitarian streak, but I have a pro one also. So I'm, I'm okay. ambivalent. I'm, that was just ooh. Go ahead. <laughs> OK. So uh, you know, I think utilitarianism is very much misunderstood, um, and, and this is part of the reason why I say we shouldn't even call it utilitarianism at all. We should call it what I call – deep pragmatism, which I think uh, better captures what utilitarianism is really like if you really apply it in real life in light of an understanding of human nature. But we can come back to that. Uh, The idea, going back to the tragedy of common sense morality, is well, you've got all of these different tribes with all of these different values based on their different ways of life. What can they do to get along? And, uh, And I think that the, the the best answer that we have is – well, let's, let's back up. In order to resolve any kind of trade-off, you have to have some kind of common metric. You have to have some kind of common currency. And I think that what utilitarianism does, whether it's the moral truth or, 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 or not, is provide a kind of common currency. So what is utilitarianism? It's basically the idea that uh, – it's really two ideas put together. One is this idea of impartiality. That is, at least as social decision makers, we should regard everybody's interests as of, as, as of equal worth. Everybody counts the same. And then you might say, okay, well, but what, what does it mean to count everybody the same? What is it that really matters for you and for me and for everybody else? And there the utilitarian's answer is what is sometimes called somewhat accurately and somewhat misleadingly happiness. Um, but it's not really happiness in the uh, in, in, in the sense of cherries on Sundays, things that make you smile. Um, it's really the quality of conscious experience. So the idea is that if you start with anything that you value and say, why do you care about that? And then keep asking, well, and why do you care about that? And why do you care about that? You'll ultimately come down to the quality of someone's conscious experience. So if I say, oh, why'd you go to work today? They say, well, I need to make money and I also enjoy my work. Well, what do you need your money for? It's like, well, you know, I need to have a place to live. It costs money. Well, why can't you just live outside? Well, I need a place to sleep. It's cold at night. Well, what's wrong with being cold? Well, it's uncomfortable. What's wrong with being uncomfortable? Well, it's just bad, right? Uh, that at some point, if you keep asking why, 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 it's going to come down to the conscious experience, the, in Bentham's terms, again, somewhat misleading, the pleasure and pain of either you or somebody else that you care about. So the utilitarian idea is to say, okay, we all have our pleasures and pains, and as a moral philosophy, we should all count equally. And so a good standard for resolving public disagreements is to say we should go with whatever option is going to produce the best overall experience for the people who are affected. Uh, which you can think of as shorthand as maximizing happiness, although, again, I think that that's somewhat misleading. Um, And this solution has a lot of merit to it, but it also has has endured uh, a couple of centuries of of legitimate criticism. And one of the biggest criticisms, and now we're getting back to the trolley cases, uh, is that utilitarianism doesn't adequately account for people's rights. Uh, So take the footbridge case. Uh, it seems that it's wrong to push that guy off the footbridge. Um, it seems that it's wrong to push the guy off the footbridge, even if you stipulate that you can save more people's lives. And so anyone who's going to defend utilitarianism as a, as a meta morality, that is a solution to the tragedy of common sense morality as a moral system to adjudicate among competing tribal moral systems. If you're going to defend it in that way, as I do, then you have to face up to these philosophical challenges. Is it okay to kill one person to save five people in this kind of situation? And uh, 
So I spend a lot of the book trying to understand the psychology of cases like the Footbridge case. And you mentioned these being kind of unrealistic and weird cases, and that's actually part of my defense. Yeah, there's, so the, a, there's a plus to it. I, I agree. Right. And, 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 and what, I, what I'm really – the idea is that your amygdala is, 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 is responding to an act of violence, and most acts of violence are bad, right? And so it is good for us to have – a gut reaction, which is really an act and a reaction in your amygdala that's then sending a signal to your ventromedial prefrontal cortex and so on and so forth. And we can talk about that. It's good to have that reaction that says, don't push people off of foot bridges. Yep. Uh, but if you construct a case in which you stipulate that committing this act of violence is going to lead to the greater good and it still feels wrong, I think it's a mistake to interpret that gut reaction as a challenge to the theory that says we should do whatever in general is going to promote the greater good. Um, that is, our, our, our gut reactions are somewhat limited. They're good for everyday life. It's good that you have a gut reaction that says don't go shoving people off of high places. Uh, but it, that shouldn't be a veto against a general idea that otherwise makes a lot of sense, which is that in the modern world, we have a lot of different competing value systems and that the way to resolve disagreements among those competing value systems is to say, well, what's going to actually produce the best consequences and best consequences measured in terms of, 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 of the quality of, of, of people's experience. So that's kind of completing or partially completing the, the, the circle between the tragedy of the commons discussion and how do we get to, to trolleys? Yeah, so I, there's some things about the utilitarian idea that are deeply appealing and you do a beautiful job making the case for it, uh, and you spend a lot of time conceding their problems with it and then giving what you think is the best answer. And I found those just, you know, again, very interesting and uh, not totally persuasive, but but provocative. I want to raise a couple of issues and, uh, and let you respond. So the first is that I think part of the reason that, that people have problems with pushing that guy off the bridge is um, there's an arrogance involved, um, which makes me nervous as a as a northern herder in your uh, example. Yeah. Um, right. So, you know, I like the idea of, of going around saving lives um, and people make lots right. of claims for yeah. the death penalty saves lives. It doesn't take lives. It saves lives. Right. And there are a lot of different claims that people make. Ultimately, most of those claims come down to empirical claims somewhat supported by evidence but not totally right. completely ironclad about yeah. how x leads to y and and one of the main themes of econ talk is that i'm kind of humble about that connection between x and y and yeah. i'm thinking you go out there and start pushing people off the of footbridges you're actually a dangerous person you're not a moral person yeah. you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna run amok i agree so i i think i think what, what you're what you're essentially doing is making a good, deep pragmatist, long-term utilitarian argument against being too quick to implement what might narrowly seem to be utilitarian solutions. And that's really, so by the way, that, that's a nice way to sorry. put it. That's really what economists do, by the way. <laughs> that's yeah. often what economists say, not so fast, right? Right. Um, so, you know, I think it depends on on, 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 on the case, right? Uh you know, when when it, when it comes to uh, you know, to take something like physician-assisted suicide, right? Uh, you might have a kind of footbridge sort of reaction. I think the the American Medical Association and a lot of people do, which says it's just wrong for you to intentionally and actively end the life of a patient, even if they want to, right? Uh, it, it pushes. I'm I'm willing to bet it pushes that amygdala button. Yeah, big time. Uh, that makes right. Yeah. Uh, but. You might say, but the greater good is served by not forcing people who are suffering and who have no no quality of life and no hope of a better life to to go go on and suffer and wait for the disease to kill them instead of them you know dying their own way. Now, on the one hand, there's something right I think about that caution that says, well, wait a second, this could go terribly wrong if yeah. we have doctors who are you know too, too too quick to say oh you want to die oh here you go uh right, right it's a slippery uh, slope you know, argument right, yeah and that you know so so on the one hand you want to be careful and you want to listen to that that amygdala signal that says you're playing with fire here but at the same time you don't want to give it an absolute veto and so i think that uh that the kind of uh skepticism about 
overly ambitious uh, social policy is a good skepticism. At the same time, uh, you know, I, th I think uh, it is often possible uh, to, 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 to do things that feel wrong, but that actually end up making things better. For sure. So let's talk about uh, the basic idea. You actually, in the book, you sum it up in three words, maximize happiness impartially. And of course, by happiness, you don't mean necessarily, although it could include um, dancing at a party while drunk um, right. or yeah. having a gorging on ice cream. It, it's a richer concept. We we talk, sometimes we call it uh, flourishing here on the program, or uh, right. I think the fancy name is eudaimonia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing right. it correctly. Uh, I think that's Aristotelian. Uh, and it's about, there's a whole very rich menu of stuff that right. give us uh, a feeling of, of pleasure, of utility, of satisfaction, right. deep tranquility, serenity, et cetera. And we're, we're going to be open about what, we're not going to try to narrow down that, 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 um, that definition. Right. So I'm with right. you there. I'm with you there. So for me as an individual, me, just me, I right. face trade-offs all the time about satisfaction and, and pleasure and happiness. Uh, how long should I stay at work? Uh, should I watch the football game instead of helping my kids with their homework? These are all questions that we face every single day as individuals, and yeah. we do our best, and, and sometimes we make mistakes that we regret. We understand that life isn't perfect. Uh, and morality, to some extent, and self-help books are trying to help us navigate those trade-offs. The problem yeah. I have with your trade-off is that, and, and I understand the desire for a common currency across these trade-offs, but they're across different people. And I can't measure happiness, even if I could. I'm not sure that I can imagine an entity that would come up with the right um, desire to make those trade-offs. So we think about this in a political context, which is naturally right. what you do in the book. So here we are in the United States. We're in this pasture. We're all here together. Right. We have very different philosophies. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have – not only do we disagree – even if we agreed, you and I, on what the right, say, way to adjudicate our dispute, we don't really have a mechanism for implementing it. We call – we think we do. We call it democracy. Yeah. But it's a very imperfect mechanism that often exploits our differences for the, the benefit and gain of individuals. So it's right. not obvious to me that it's a, even a good idea to say let's pretend we could decide what is the greatest happiness across – these 330 million people, let alone the 7 billion, and then hope that somehow it'll get implemented. Does that really a practical solution to our political problems? No, I don't think that there is any alternative. I think that we are living someone's attempts to adjudicate these trade-offs of values. And we can, we, we can either just you know, it, it, it accept what the powers that be put in front of us, or we can vote uh, our, our our conscience and, and 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 try to change them, or vote our conscience and say yes, I I endorse this. But I think that what you're objecting to is the difficulty of the problem, not an inherent problem with the solution, if you want to call it that, that I'm proposing. So I mean, I think it's easier to think about these things with a with a concrete example. So take the case of uh, of raising taxes on the wealthiest American. Uh, now, uh, let's, let's suppose and I know that this is, 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 is controversial. Um, but let's suppose that governments, government, government spending, uh, you know, can, can provide good stimulus to the economy and can, can in, in, in increase employment and make things better off for the people who are in, in, in employed as a result. Okay. So you have to do a trade-off. You might say, how much do the wealthiest people lose by having their incomes reduced uh, by you know some some amount from some you know someone who's making uh, you know half a million dollars a year uh, you know they 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 they, they might pay uh, you know instead of saying thirty percent in taxes they'd pay forty percent or something like that uh, versus the benefits that go to people who now have jobs as a result of uh, the, the 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 expansion of the public sector or children who have uh, you know, be better shot at, at li li living a good life because of increased commitment to early childhood education, et cetera. There are a lot of empirical assumptions here or, or questions here, but if we can at least agree on the em em empirics, then there's the, the, then there's the question of, okay, is this trade trade off worth it? I don't think there's any way to avoid asking that question. And I think that in a lot of these cases, uh, it's actually pretty clear that 
uh, for example, taking people who are already very wealthy and reducing their income somewhat doesn't really do much to their happiness. Whereas if you provide uh, opportunities to people at the bottom of the scale that actually can make an enormous difference in their, in their lives. So, you know, I, 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 I think that the, the alternative is to just say, well, let, let it, let it, let, let it just evolve the way it evolves without consciously thinking about this as a, as, as a social problem. But I don't think that that's a, a better alternative. Well, that's because you're a Southerner. Um, I'm a Northerner, <laughs> right? And as a Northerner, I say, if we get the government out of this, the private sector charity and other ways will be done to help poor people. They'll take right. money from rich people. They do give it voluntarily, maybe not as much as we'd like, certainly not right. as much as they give if they were forced to give. Uh, right. but, but, they're, the, the, but the real issue I have, and I think this is the, this is, this is my meta meta morality, I guess. Um, uh, cause, and I think it's, it's, it's really a interesting, interesting thought experiment. The real problem I have is, is the empirical assumptions that you need to make uh, for some reason don't appeal to me. And they do tend to appeal to people who are the collectivists, right? So right. The, you made a lot of – you just gave a couple. We could think of 10 more. Better schools, better preschools, uh, yeah. more training programs, uh, greener this, uh, reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions, stimulate yeah. the economy, reduce unemployment. And most of those things everybody agrees on would be good if they happened. But mm -hmm. strangely enough – and this is to me a different kind of tragedy. Strangely enough, the people who are from the north, us individualists – we seem to think that the empirical evidence is very unconvincing, whereas the people from the South find it extremely compelling. So right. it, what, we, what it comes down to is a, a pretense, what I fear. It's a pretense we're doing something scientific by right. just looking at the outcomes rather than arguing about our principles. We're just going to look at this. We're just going to see what, what works the best. But right. that's kind of a false – that's kind of an illusion, I worry. What, what do you think? So but why? Well, I guess I, I I see this problem on both sides. I think that both sides I do too. <laughs> uh, interpret the evidence. The evidence in social science is almost always ambiguous, and both sides interpret the evidence uh, so as to support the kind of uh, the, to support the kind of social policy that they in intuitively favor. I think that's that 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 that's a problem on both sides. I agree. Uh, but you know. Uh, I, I think it's it, it's not an impossible task to actually sort out uh, to, to to sort out the fact from the bias, and you know the the the, the signal to noise ratio may be lower than we'd like, but I still think that there there there, there is a signal there. Um, I think one thing that we can do, and this is one of the major practical points in the book, uh, is to not think of these social problems when we're really trying to have an honest discussion about it in terms of rights. Yeah, because, I really like that, by the way, even though I've heard – I've probably made those rights arguments. I thought this was fantastic. Go yeah, ahead. and I, I use the language of rights as well, and I think it has its place as I also argue in, 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 in the book. But if something becomes a matter of rights, so take capital punishment, it's the public's you know, right to see justice done, which means having the person killed. Or uh, capital punishment is a violation of human rights, as, as Amnesty International says. If you make something about rights, then it essentially leaves the realm of the empirical because we can essentially use the language of rights as a front for whatever our automatic settings say, for whatever our amygdala says, right? Yep. Uh, and so you know, one, one way to try to make progress from both sides is to say, okay, we're not going to discuss these problems in terms of absolute rights because we have no way of figuring out what, who, what rights people really have in some ultimate metaphysical sense. And instead we can ask which kinds of policies actually, actually work. Um, and we can do that. You know, I mean, a lot of these things are difficult because we can't do controlled experiments because you know we're, we're not rats living yeah. in a lab. We're people living in a society where it's imp almost impossible to do controlled experiments with things like the death penalty or but a stimulus. We can, yeah. Right, but we can, but we can look at other countries, let's say, that don't have the death penalty, and say, well, do they have rampant murder problems, um, or is there something fundamentally different about those societies such that you know it's something else that's making them relatively. Uh, murder-free compared to the, compared to the United States, but you know I, I think that the the the, the uh, empirical battle is is winnable, but it's 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 uh, ten steps forward, nine, nine steps back. So let me let me let me phrase the the challenge in a different way. You, you can say at one point in the book, uh, you reject it, but <clears throat> you can see one point in the book is that people think we're already doing this. We're already yeah we we favor the policies that work out the best, right and or that create the most happiness or, or good for most people or, 
you know, are the, quote, best policies. And isn't part of the problem really that that we're really pretending what we're arguing about? It's all rhetoric. We're, you know, we all have our, our stories to tell, as, as Ed Lemer says, we're, we're pattern-seeking, storytelling animals. So we cherry-pick our data. And um, it's just all this, all this utilitarian stuff, all it's really doing is just giving me a different rhetorical frame for uh, I'm not really going to make progress. So tell well, me something cheerful. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's take the let, 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 let's take the case of uh, prison policies and things like solitary confinement uh, and other I- I- exceptionally harsh uh, treatments that exist in in in, in American prisons. Uh, what you're seeing now, you see a lot of this in the news. Is you know, for a long time, people on the left have been saying, uh, you know, these 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 practices uh, of of exceptionally harsh punishment uh, in in prisons is not doing anything to help anyone. It doesn't deter that crime very much because most prisoners are not paying attention. Most would be criminals are not paying attention to these uh, level level of details. It makes things you know, uh, miserable worse. for the prisoners. Could be worse. It, 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 sorry. Yeah, it could be worse for society. It it, it, it reduces their ability to come out and be something doing something exactly, productive right. And, right and and what you're seeing now is uh, I mean I've been uh, is people on the right who are coming around to say look this is not productive this is not helping this is a place where we're actually I think just beginning to see a consensus uh, on left and right uh, at least on you know certain flashpoint issues like solitary confinement and things like that and it's really driven by it's I think it's really driven by evidence um, so, you know, that, 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 yeah, that's, that's, that's a that's good example. example. And I, I'd use the drug war as another example. I think right. it's hard for – there are a lot of people who see it as a um, a rights-based issue. People should not have the right to harm themselves. And right. um, when they see the, output, the, the effect of the drug war, they start – some, not all, but some people do change their minds based on the fact that they actually don't think it's making the world a better place. It's not reducing necessarily even the amount of drugs being taken. It's corrupting the police, et cetera. So, yeah, I don't mean to argue that empirical evidence or or reality doesn't doesn't come into it. I'm just a little worried about the uh, the bigger overarching claim. Let me let me ask you a um, a couple different uh, challenges, and um, this is a little bit like ask you know ask the ask the doctor. These are hard ones. Um, Uber, the car sharing. Taxi-ish uh, service that you can use on yeah. your iPhone recently got in trouble for um, in Sydney during Australia during a crisis situation, uh, and it's happened yeah. out with other with natural yeah. disasters. Uh, yeah. There's an increase in demand to to get somewhere, and the Uber right. algorithm raises the price, which right. draws more drivers into the area. And yeah. as an economist, whether I'm a southerner or not, or northern or not, I mean uh, that kind of I love that. I see more people getting out of town. A lot of people can't see it. They don't care even. They see that it's just wrong to take advantage of people, and uh, they think Uber is is immoral. And to me, to me, it's amoral, and in fact, it's good. So why do you think people have that reaction to price, so-called price gouging? So I actually haven't followed the details of the Uber situation, and I would say whether or not I think it's a good or bad thing – will probably turn on facts that are not much discussed in the case. So I think the kind of standard block response to, to price gouging is, uh, you, you know, there, 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 there's, there's a flood and the people who are selling buckets are suddenly selling it for a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars each. And the idea is you are exploiting those people. You're not, you're, 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 you're making it harder for people to deal with their emergency and they could be losing an awful lot. Because you're saying, hey, this is a chance where I can make an extra buck. And so from a utilitarian perspective, you're saying, okay, so you get a little extra money selling your stuff and the other person's house gets flooded. Or I should have said fire, right? There's a fire and the person's selling buckets uh, and the, person's, the other person's house is burning down and you're concerned about making, making a few extra dollars taking advantage of someone in need. There, I think – the utilitarian analysis clearly says price gouging is terrible. You're taking a little gain for yourself, relatively speaking, uh, because someone is desperate and they're trying to save, uh, you know, the, the the their house, which is worth much much more to them. If that's what's going on, then I think price gouging is bad, and it might be good to have regulations in and place. And that's for a that's a right. world where there's a fixed number of buckets. 
and exactly. in a fixed number of buckets. Right. Now, it's if not what's a bad going argument. on in Uber is all of these people saying, you know, I'm I, 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 I'm willing to you know work overtime essentially. I'm willing to add extra uh, you know travel capacity, but you know I'm not willing to do it for my usual price. I'm willing to do it for a little bit more. But fortunately, there are people who are willing to pay for it. I actually think that that is overall a better thing. So if it's actually increasing the availability of transportation at a time when people need it, that's better. Now, it would be better still if people said, you know what, I'm willing to do this as a kind of partial public service where I will get paid for it, but I'm not going to increase my rate even though I could. Um, That would be even better. But, uh, you know, we naturally compare it to Uber at the usual price instead of someone staying home and and, 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 and not driving at all. So... Uh, when I said that I think it depends critically on on facts that aren't normally discussed, I would say it really depends on whether or not the alternative is not providing the service as opposed to providing the service at the usual price. So I'm going to I'm going to concede my utilitarian side here, agree with with you in the in the following way, which is that I think one of the things that's often missing from these conversations, and it, it's missing from some of the moral dilemmas in 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 the psychology literature that you cite is an awareness of what Hayek called the knowledge problem, the fact that knowledge is dispersed and it's very hard to get it in the real world into people's heads quickly. So in the case of Sydney, uh, a lot of people didn't know that there was a crisis going on. A lot of people didn't realize there were hundreds, maybe thousands of people that wanted to get to the airport. And maybe if they knew, they would have volunteered to help them. They would have done a bunch of things. But that, that app alerted dozens or hundreds of drivers that there are a bunch of people who needed help and right. and that price played an incredibly important role so my yeah. my utilitarian side is where it agrees with you is is that i actually am, am naive enough to think that if more and more people understood that phenomenon they would be more understanding of higher prices and crises so maybe that's my uh that's my uh idealistic utilitarian side yeah no i agree i think it's a uh, yeah. Well said. So I want to take an example you use that I found really interesting. Uh, I think all of us have to think about it, whether we're utilitarian or not. It's an example you take from Peter Singer. Uh, you say you're out, you're strolling in the park and you come across a, a shallow pond and there's a child, small child sw- stumbled into it and is struggling and is going to drown. You can wade in and uh, save the child, but you're going to ruin your $500 suit. And most people say you're morally obligated to wade in. You have to give up the five hundred dollar suit to save the child. Right. The problem uh, is that it's much more uh, difficult to then say instead of buying the five hundred dollar suit, you should have sent it to a charity in Africa uh, to save a child's uh, life and maybe two children. Yep. Uh, so, talk about that issue from the utilitarian perspective and what how you how you uh, respond to it. Right. So, I, I think that that P- Peter Singer had one of the most important insights of the 21st century, uh, which is the non-obvious moral equivalence of those two cases that you, that you, that you described, which is of course controversial, but I, I think he's basically right. And I think that this is reflected in our, uh, in, in, in our intuitive morality, which both the, with, as, as a result of our biology and our cultural experience. So, you know, we, we, we evolved both biologically and culturally to live in relatively small groups in which we cooperate, we solve the tragedy of the commons with the people who are immediately around us. And so when you imagine seeing that child right in front of you, that pushes those emotional buttons that say, you have to do something. This is a person who counts. This is a person who uh, is or is likely to be a member of, of, of your community. But we didn't evolve to uh, cooperate with or, or even care about people on the other side of the world. And so, you know, from a biological perspective, the mystery is not why are we indifferent to far away suffering, but even why do we care about the people in front of us? But we, we I, I argue, many, uh, many people argue that this is what morality is about. It makes you willing to pay that cost, at least in the short term, to benefit, uh, to benefit somebody else. But overall, we end up uh, better off if we all have these moral impulses. So... I think that this is essentially a limitation of our intuitive morality, that through some combination of biological and cultural shaping, we are, it, it pushes our emotional moral buttons when we have the child right in front of us, but children or even worse, adults on the other side of the world uh, don't have that kind of uh, – don't, don't, don't uh, push our buttons in that way. Um, 
And uh, I think that, uh, you know, if we're, if we're looking to construct a meta morality, that is to have a kind of moral standard that we can, that can work for the whole world as opposed to, uh, to, to, to just the tribe, then it's going to require uh, valuing the lives, valuing the well-being of, 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 of distant people uh, as, as, as much as we value the, the, the well-being of people who are, are nearby. Maybe not in our hearts, but at least in terms of the kinds of policies that we feel that we can publicly justify. Yeah, and my first thought when I, when I read your example was the, this knowledge problem, which is – when I give the two hundred and fifty dollars or the five hundred to the charity, I'm not sure it's really going to make a difference. Right. And of course, that could just be my rationalization um, right. for why I can be selfish and hold my head high. So I'm. Right. I, I think your book makes us think about those issues in a very uh, thoughtful way. And I think one of the biggest lessons of the book is uh, slow down. <laughs> You're so right. sure that you know yep. what the right thing is. Step back yep. and be open. Um, and this is a theme of Jonathan Heights also who you cite and who's been a guest on the program. Uh, try to put your – it's hard, but try to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else's morality. Uh, it's a very productive thing to do. Yeah, that's – think slow uh, when it comes to morality and I think is one of the, the, the major major points I'm trying to make. Unless you're on the footbridge because then you have to think faster. It's too late. But anyway, um, to, let me let me raise a, a different set of issues Um uh as an economist, I think sometimes about the minimum wage and, and how uh, controversial it is and yeah. the arguments on both sides. And I, deep down, I do like to think that it's a utilitarian uh, issue is that what is really best for poor people um, and low-skilled people? And does this really help them or does it hurt them? And both yeah. sides have evidence, of course. And right. and you may, I just as an aside, you make a great point that – a lot of people are are northerners because they like their individualists because they they're selfish and it gives them cover for their selfishness. What I think you fail to point out is that southerners sometimes like to run people's lives and they like power and they sometimes use uh, so they have their each side has its own sort of evil twin, evil cousin yeah. that if we're not careful, um, it, it, I you, have to say though I, I'm gonna I, I think the things are not quite as symmetrical on that point. I I really do think that selfishness is pretty basic and pervasive for humans and for other animals. I think that the idea of the liberal who inherently wants to run other people's lives, I actually think that that's a myth. I think that that's a boogeyman. I think that, you know, there are, there are certainly plenty of misguided liberals and liberal policies, people who think that something's going to help and it actually ends up making things that make, making things worse. But I, I don't think, I don't think that, uh, desire to sort of run other people's lives is actually a major force behind uh, either well-guided or mis mis misguided liberalism. Um, that's well, my, my, yeah. my, my take on it. Uh, well, I but, like, but I, like your asymmet I like your asymmetry point. The problem is, is that uh, centralizing power um, yeah. can lead to totalitarianism and, mm -hmm. and often is justified because it's benign. And of course, it's rarely, in my opinion, it's rarely benign. That, that I agree with. That I agree with. So, I'm saying I think, I think rank and file liberal voters, let's say, I don't think are particularly interested in, 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 in running other people's lives. But I, I agree that there is, a, there is a strong tendency towards mission creep and that yeah. once, once individuals have a certain power to do something, then they have an incentive to maintain and expand that power. I think that, that that's absolutely right. So what I was going to say, though, before I digressed, um, minimum wage is an important thing. I think more important yeah. more, more important problem is, you know, what do we do about people who are struggling to, to acquire skills and right. who have trouble finding a job? And it's, of course, a very complex problem. We, don't, we have some empirical right. evidence, hard to argue about. Let's take a bigger problem, what I would call a bigger problem, which is the problem of what you might call the bottom billion. The people right. are not just – struggling to express themselves or making less than they otherwise would, but are yeah. near death, uh, really tragic, horrible situations around the world. I don't see that very much as a, a common sense morality problem. It's more of a power um, zero-sum game where people are taking money from other folks and getting enhanced, keeping a system going that is good for them and not so good for the rest of the people. Sort of in, in autocratic regimes yeah. like – Perhaps the best example would be North Korea, right? Correct. Where you have a, yeah. a powerful elite who, who's, who's, you know, basically hold, hold, holding a lot of uh, human potential hostage. Yeah. Right. Do you agree with that? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, 
a, a lot of the world's worst situations are 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 the result of corrupt politics. Um, you know, yeah. as, as as opposed to real sort of moral disagreement among communities. Yeah, I just I think um, other than global warming, uh, which is you know potentially a, threatens the uh, the planet, although I'm a skeptic to some extent. Uh, of course, as <laughs> you might expect, and you're not as we would expect. Um, uh, most of these problems are, are – m- many of our worst problems are, are not morality problems. It seems to me they're, they're – we just don't know what's going on. Either we don't know what's going on fully or it's – there's something more basic going on. So I, I – again, I like, I like your attempt to, to avoid conflict. I'm not sure it's, it's the central problem. But but even then though we as 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 third parties face a moral question right which is do we intervene and if we do intervene how do we intervene right yep. do we use force to overthrow a kind of a, 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 a oppressive regime or do we impose uh, economic sanctions as a result of what we see as human rights abuses so uh, and and there are disagreements within our own community about how if at all we should respond to uh, to, to 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 people who are being oppressed by by bad political arrangements. So I think that in a sense, you know, I mean the 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 the, the powerful economies of the world, those nations could get together and pretty much do what they want uh to uh to 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 uh most of the world's nasty autocratic regimes. And it's a question of, but you know, the question of well, why 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 don't we and is it is it is is it wise restraint or 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 lack of moral will or something in between that prevents us from doing that. And I, I, I agree with you there that the uh it's not so much to me the utilitarian argument but the consequentialist argument relative say to a rights or a rights based argument. You know, people will argue we need to intervene in this situation because it's just the right thing to do. Uh, those people over there, their rights are being violated. We have to help them, and we have the power to do so. And I look at it and say, well, we've tried this nine times. It worked one of them. That's not yeah. good. Oh, yeah. maybe, maybe we should be more um, cautious. Um, let's let's close with a, with a philosophical issue, which is really beautiful in the book, um, where you imagine you have a credible thought experiment. Uh, so, and you you use it to to argue for utilitarianism. I I wasn't persuaded by it, but I loved it. I thought it was great. So, imagine we could create a world of three different kinds of species. Uh, species one is Homo selfishus. Species okay. species two is Homo just like us, and species three is Homo utilis or utilis uh, utilitus. Tell us uh, what are those three species and what you come down with. What's your right. argument? Yeah, so so to provide a little bit of a background for this, I think that you know one of the big problems philosophically with utilitarianism is the Peter Singer problem and 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 seeing where it goes. That is, where how, how what utilitarianism essentially says is that at least you know, if you're an ideal utilitarian, you'll turn yourself into a happiness pump. That is, you will just use whatever resources you have to make the world as happy as possible. And what that means in practice is using all of your resources to alleviate the misery of people uh, who, who, who are in the worst possible shape, right? Um, and so there's nothing left for you personally, nothing left for your friends and your family. It's all just going to uh, the bottom 1%, right? And so how do you make sense of that? Because that seems to be above and beyond. And it seems to be a point against utilitarianism if, if it's overly demanding. So it's essentially a question of, how, how does it? How does a utilitarian or a deep pragmatist uh, deal with this over demandingness objection? And my answer is to say, look, uh, instead of putting the blame on utilitarianism, why don't we put the blame on ourselves? But 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 accept that there are limits to how much we're going to do about it. So uh, you know, when I, I, I when I you know have a birthday party for 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 my son or my daughter, instead of giving the money to charity, you know, question: Can I really justify that in utilitarian terms? And in a sense, I can't, but at the same time, you have to operate within the limitations of your own mind and your, your own species. Uh, we, weren't, we didn't evolve for universal benevolence, and so it's not, I think, really in the cards for us to try to, to, try to go there, at least not directly. Nevertheless, I think that we can step back and recognize that there is something better about universal benevolence, and that's what this thought experiment is about. So what we say is suppose that you're – a god or god or just in charge of the universe and you can create a new species 
And Homo selfishus is a species of people where the, they, they only care about themselves. They only care about themselves and a few other people. And they, they do everything they can uh, to amass as many resources for themselves as individuals and don't care about anybody else. And this ends up being a Hobbesian nightmare. And, and obviously, this is not a very good world to live in. So we'll say, okay, we're not going to create that species. The real contenders are what I call Homo just like us and Homo utilitas. Homo just like us is uh, – we care a lot about ourselves and the people with whom we have close relationships, our close friends and our family, and to some extent about people with whom we have a certain shared identity. And most of the world we care about in a distant kind of way, but not enough to make much of a sacrifice. So we can you know, know that there are people who are uh, children who are dying of preventable diseases, and we'd say, well, I'd like to help, but uh, instead I'm going to renovate my kitchen because I'd like it to look nicer. Um, and in that world – most a lot of people are very happy, but there's an enormous amount of, uh, of 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 preventable misery that doesn't get prevented because people aren't willing to make any kind of sacrifice for people with whom they don't have a kind of personal connection. And then Homo utilitas is the species where everybody loves everybody, or at least everybody is willing to make sacrifices for the well-being of other people. Um, and uh, in, in in that world, you know, just something you, you might imagine is that these are like mindless drones who have no kinds of uh, who have 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 no personality or no uh, personal relationships. But I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think the right way to think about it is in terms of just some of the people who are a bit more heroic than most of us. So someone who's willing to donate a kidney to a stranger, or someone like Wesley Autry who is willing to dive uh, in, in front of a subway car to save a guy who is having a, 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 an epileptic seizure from, from, from being crushed by a train. Um, if you had a world full of people like that who have friends and family and who take care of themselves but who are willing to make sacrifices for other people when there are other people in great need, I think the world would be a lot happier. And even if we don't have it in us to sort of make those sacrifices, we sort of fallible humans, we can see that that would be a kind of better species, the kind of species you would choose to make if you were in charge of the universe. And so the idea is really just if you actually step back from uh, the limitations of our human values, we can see that even as we, we, we are unwilling to uh, abandon the selfishness and the parochialism of our, of, of our commitments, we can see that there would be something admirable or that it would be more ideal if we could get rid of – could expand our concern even if uh, we don't see ourselves doing that anytime soon. Yeah, I just want to comment, and it's interesting, in Jewish law, you're obligated to give 10% of your income to charity. You, yeah. can, you can give up to 20, uh -huh. but after 20, you're discouraged because you risk becoming uh, poor yourself. And right. that's, uh, again, a kind I of... I didn't know about that. That, that limit. limit, yeah. So that's kind of a consequent, kind of a utilitarian consequentialist uh, right. motive in there. So we're, we're over time, but it's, it's so interesting. I'm just going to cl close with one last question, let you finish it off, finish it up. Um, you talk about the fact that, you know, these tribal differences are, it's, it's a little bit depressing. You've proposed a way to try to improve on them. A lot of people are very discouraged about the state of political life in America, the kind of differences we've been talking about, but philosophical differences, which seem to be difficult to resolve. And you, you propose one way to get to, to, to improve things. One view would say it's actually it's it's getting worse. A lot of people think it's getting worse. It, we're more partisan. We're more combative. We get less done. Uh, this and of course, as a northerner, I always think, well, maybe that's a good thing because I don't. Maybe I don't want us to work together so much because I don't always like the outcome. But put that to the side. So the general feeling is things are getting getting worse, and yet at the same time, you have people like Stephen Pinker, who you cite in the book, yeah. talking about how things are really getting a lot better. We're actually making progress as as human beings and how we treat each other. Uh, yeah. Where do you fall on that? Half full, half empty. What do you think? I I think that you know Pinker and the and 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 the and the evidence he cites is absolutely right. Uh, that is that it, in in almost every way that matters, the world is getting better. Now that's not to say that there couldn't be some grand reversal as a result of climate change. Or recently, uh, you've talked about unfriendly artificial intelligence with Nick Bostrom, which is something I've been thinking uh, a, lot, a lot about myself and, 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 and things like that. So I don't want to say that our continued out of the uh, woods. decent prosperity <laughs> you know, has to, as a matter of, 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 of social scientific law, continue forever. But I think that despite the sense we get from reading the newspaper, the world is, 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 is absolutely getting better. Um, and, and it, the question is why I think it's because we are cobbling together, uh, a, a, a meta morality that we are building 
systems that allow us not only to put uh, us ahead of me, but allow us to reconcile uh, the competing moral visions of the world's different us's and forge some kind of a global system that can, can, can allow as many people as possible to, to flourish. My guest today has been Joshua Green. His book is Moral Tribes. Josh, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.